Good afternoon. This is the webinar on the quantitative BCA based on the industry-wide data sets. Uh, uh, he will, will be presenting Steve Wibretze, Julia Maria Martinez Tapia, Soli, Soli, and Amir Polizadeh. So, welcome, and let's go to it. If you can move to the following slide, please, Amir. Yeah. That's the agenda for today. We will begin with um, with an introduction, just to remind what uh, we were talking about VCA 1.0 and VCA 2.0 in previous webinars. Then we will go for the VCA 3.0 uh, approach, and we will talk about the steps of the analysis. And at the end, we will analyze a case study for VCA 3.0. We have this video to share. Thank you, Julia. Um, as a recap for the previous two sessions that we addressed, uh, we want to talk about in the context of the transfer pricing, um, value chain analysis plays a very important role in understanding the allocation of profits and the risk crossover um, across various stages on the company's operation. Um, it helps us gain insights into the economic cir circumstances of the value creation and contribution for each entities within the multinationals. Um, as you can see in the, uh, in the graph, TPA has developed three approaches for value, value chain analysis. It's so-called VCA 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. And uh, uh, value chain analysis 1.0, the qualitative value chain analysis involves a comprehensive assessment of the functions, uh, assets, and the risk associated with each value creation process and uh, each value driver. It focuses on um, understanding the value adding activities performed by different entities within the multinational enterprise. Uh, in 1.0, we discussed um, uh, how to identify the, the, the critical success factors for certain industries and the techniques to visualize the value chain analysis in a logical and a straightforward way. And if we can move to the next slide. And uh, uh, subsequently in 2.0, we discuss the reliable data sources from the multinational themselves for quantifying the profit and the allocation key. And, uh, the, um, and the leading or, or complementary role of the quantitative value chain analysis would play to the VCA 1.0. So uh, today in value chain analysis 3.0, we would like to take one step further uh, in the quantitative analysis and using the industry data to identify the most relevant factors in the financial, financial statements that explain the a bit of the companies in this in that industry the best um now i'll give the floor to julia our colleague who has a very extensive experience in data analytics for over 10 years uh julia hey thank you very much and yeah so we now begin with uh with the approach on these steps of the bca 3.0 uh if you can go one slide back, Amir, just to... Yeah. Okay, so the VCA 3.0 approach can be seen as complementary to the existing transactional transactional uh, pricing methods. And the idea is to add 
objectivity to the current way ABC is performed based on the, on the guidelines of the OECD. So the approach intends to identify which are the value drivers that have a relevant impact on the EBIT in an organization and with the purpose to use them as allocation keys to the residual profit. That's the intention of the, of the purpose of the approach. The steps could be resumed in three steps. First one is the economic analysis. Firstly, to perform a BCA analysis 3.0, we begin with selecting the economically relevant variables in an industry and then creating a representative sample of companies in this industry. That would be the first step. Then we go for the statistical and econometri econometric analysis. That could be the hard part if you don't know about statistics, but um, it is not our intention that you fully understand the statistical procedure here, but just the idea or the intention um, we, we have with this, with this uh, step, okay? We will have a look at it in detail uh, then in the, in the case study. But by now, it's just for you to know that we will be doing, firstly, a correlation analysis to check whether there is a linear relationship between the variables, mainly the dependent versus the independent variables. For those of you that don't know about the correlation analysis, um, it uses two relevant concepts, which is the dependent variables and the dependent variables. The dependent variable is the main factor that you're trying to understand or predict. In the case of the BCA 3.0, this uh, dependent variable, this main factor, factor we're trying to understand is the EBIT. And the independent variables would be the factors that we suspect uh, have an impact on the dependent variable. In our case, it could be the revenue, the full-time employees, cost of goods sold, uh, OPEX, etc. And independent variables are also known as explanatory or predictor variables, depending on the research. And once we have performed this correlation analysis, we are in a position to decide if the variables we are looking at are significant enough to start a regression analysis. We will have a look at it later too, but a regression analysis um, is a mathematical model that uh, try to or intends to detect which uh, variables can be used as predictors for a dependent variable. Okay, you will understand, I mean, or I think uh, better later. So that would be the second step. Firstly, the economic analysis, selecting the relevant variables and the companies in the industry. Secondly, performing this statistical and econometric analysis with the correlation analysis and the regression analysis, all for the purpose to, to detect, which, detect which are the significant variables to predict the EBIT in a company. And at the end, the third step would be connecting all, the, uh, all this analysis, the result of this analysis to the value chain of the industry. So the significant, um, the significant variables resulting for this regression analysis needs to be connected with the value chain in the industry. So if really that allocation makes sense and is significant in connection to the value chain, these variables uh, can be used as allocation keys to the residual profit of the organization. So that's the purpose of the analysis, to get to these significant variables that can be used as allocation keys. For you to understand better how it works, we have prepared a um, case study. It is related to the fast fashion apparel industry. <coughs> Follow one slide, please, Andrew. So far, we have run two different BCA 3.0 analyses on the fast uh, apparel industry. And they refer to uh, two different sets of years. The first uh, analysis we developed was on uh, data from fiscal years 2013 to 2017. And then we develop a second uh, analysis, a second model on data from fiscal years 2015 uh, to 2019. 
We will refer to the most recent analysis following in the following slides, unless otherwise specified. Okay, so we will begin with the uh, with the fast fashion apparel value chain. Here we've got the most relevant value drivers in the uh, fast fashion apparel value chain. The design, procurement, manufacturing, logistics, marketing, and sales and distribution. So the idea would be to be able to make this quantification of the value chain using the value or as complementary, the value chain analysis 3.0 we are we are talking about. So you can go to the we need to we need to quickly ask everyone's okay. opinion here. Thank you. We got the first question. Which one of the following factors do you think could be a value driver of the EBIT in an industry? Intangible assets, wage expenses, sales or revenue, total costs, or all of the above? If you want to vote, then we will have a look at the results. Okay, so uh, uh, Amir, I think that uh, the audience can be can can see the results, or they do not. Uh, yeah, I think. Okay. Think, yeah. So as you can see, uh, the result um, is what some people understand it with intangible, which is yes, really really important, but it is in fact the the data harder to get, but yeah, for sure intangible are important. Also, sales and revenues, total costs. But the majority of people have voted all of the above. That makes sense because all of these uh, factors can be value drivers of EBIT, EBIT. And one of them or some of them will have more weight than the others, depending on the, on the industry we are talking about. We can move on. Okay, so if we begin with this uh, case study, with the BCA 3.0 analysis for this fast fashion apparel industry, the first uh, step would be the economic analysis. And in this context, first thing we do is searching for the independent variables, I mean the value drivers, which we think that could drive value or have impact on the dependent variable EBIT. For running our model, we use these uh, variables, these independent variables you can see on, on screen, capital expenditure, cost of goods sold, financial assets, intangible assets, inventory, marketing costs, number of full-time employees, operational expenses, research and development expenditure, revenue, tangible assets, total assets, total costs, total equity, and wage expenses. That means that we needed to collect data regarding all of these variables. And we collected data regarding all of these variables of 15 companies during five years. Okay, that's the second model. Uh, the score was five years for uh, 2015 to 2019. And these were the 15 companies we, we selected. You can see here in the text, Adidas, H&M, Nike, um, <clears throat> Daflore. So we thought that these 15 entities have an enough market share to be considered representative for this fast fashion apparel industry. And with this information, thank you, Amir, with this information, uh, we prepared the data set that what you can see on the screen is just a partial view because the data set is too, too large to show it uh, just in a screenshot. But here you can see part of it. We have got uh, these uh, columns. In the columns, we've got the company, the year, K 
Okay, you can see it goes from uh, 2015 to 2019. And then we have included here just four variables, but uh, as I just said, it was uh, 15. But here you can see capital expenditure, cost of goods sold, financial assets, and intangible assets. And we collected this information from the financials uh, of these uh, uh, entities or groups, because these are con the consolidated figures for fiscal year 2015 to 2019. So that was the, the uh, data set cost composed. The second step was the, uh, or is the statistical and economic, econometric analysis. The first part of this um, analysis is the linear correlation analysis. This is a statistical method. And we use it to discover if there is a linear relationship between two variables and how strong this linear relationship uh, is. And that allows us to identify which factors, which variables could be, could be significant, or we consider a preliminary could be significant in connection to the EBIT as the OCDE uh, intended. So what is a linear, no, please go back. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So what is a linear, Relationship. A linear relationship means that the variables are connected in the sense that they tend to move in the same direction. So you got to look at this uh, diagram on the left. That's a positive correlation. That means that when the variable X increases, the variable in the uh, Y axis also increases. That's a positive correlation. Normally, what we do, uh, what we represent in the X axis is the independent variable. In our case, it could be whatever, I don't know, revenue, for instance. What we represent in the Y axis is the dependent variable. In our case, the EBIT. So the idea is that when the independent variable increases, when the revenue increases, if there is a positive uh, linear relationship with the EBIT, the EBIT also increases. That's the idea. Uh, you can also have a negative correlation, which is the diagram on the on the right, and that means that when uh, that the two, uh, two variables have an opposite relationship, meaning that one of them increases, the other one decreases. So in our example. It would cut, which would make no sense, obviously, but uh, it would mean that the variable in the X, that the revenue in our example, would have an opposite relationship with the EBIT. So uh, as the revenue increases, the EBIT decreases, which obviously make no sense because in between the revenue and the EBIT, yeah, really, there is a positive correlation, or should be a positive correlation. But that's the idea. There is a negative correlation when you've got uh, an opposite tendency in the relation between these two variables. That's the idea. And if there is no relationship between these two variables, you've got a zero or a low linear correlation, which is represented in, the, in this uh, plot in the middle. We can go ahead. <coughs> okay, what you have seen in the um, in the slide before, was the relationship between one independent variable and the dependent variable. Okay, that's just two variables. But usually we do not work like that. What we do is uh, uh, is taking the all the all the data set we've got, and we compare all the variables we've got, and analyze if there is any linear correlation between them. I know that these figures are a little small. We can have a look at uh, then at the following slide, but not now, Amir, please. Um, and you will have a look at a higher, in a higher size, okay? But this is for you to understand that what I'm doing here is showing the correlation percentage in this case between all of the variables. So we've got here on the left, the EBIT, which is a dependent variable, and below, you can see the 15 independent variables. 
and then as columns, we've got the same. The dependent variable firstly, and then all the independent variables. So if you go to the cell where both the column and the and the row met, you can see meet, meet. You can see which is the linear relationship among them. So we can see it better in the following slide. If you can go there, me. Okay, that represents the correlation, the linear correlation between the um, between the independent variables and the EBIT, which is the dependent variable. Okay, so here we can see, for instance, that the total equity, which is the last independent variable, has a linear correlation with the EBIT of 86%. That means that there is a high correlation. This, this is a positive correlation, and it's a high correlation. From a statistical perspective, it is a high correlation, really. As from 70%, it can be considered a high correlation. Um, there is something weird here, if you have a look at it. Here at the intangible assets, we've got we have got low correlation, and probably, or you may you may think that that not makes sense because intangible assets are expected to have a high impact on the on the EBIT, or we all can expect that. So that's a little strange, and that the explanation is that it's in the data, and is that the data on intangible assets is the harder to obtain, as I think I said before. Because um, not in all cases, the companies have these uh, assets reflected in their financial statements. So it can be the case that the company has developed uh, or it has got a goodwill with a high amount or maybe a trademark, but it is not. Uh, it does not appear as intangible assets in the as intangible asset in its financial statements. So that's the reason it is uh, so hard to to capture this data. In the case, it seems that uh, the data was not really on intangible assets was not really significant because the correlation at the at the end does make no sense. Julia, the question yes. here: Would would you uh, because this is taken from the annual accounts, uh, so this is all public information of those uh, fifteen uh, uh, fast uh, fashion uh, apparel companies. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be an idea because there is value valuation of brand in a different data set available in the public domain to add that uh, extra data set uh, to uh, to run that analysis because I, I there's a there's brand valuation companies who publish lists of what is the mm -hmm. value of Zara or Inditex and uh, and H and M for example or Nike so that that. Yeah partially uh, eliminate uh, the, the lack of data here or the lack of consistent data here in relationship to EBITDA because that's what, what we're seeing here. If you develop your own brand like H&M, it's, it's not showing in your, in your numbers, uh, in your financial accounting numbers as, as a genuine uh, asset in most cases, uh, unless you bought some, some intangible assets from from other companies would that would that be an idea that you rather have 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 multiple data sources to close the gap here we're looking at uh, in this analysis yes you can do that uh, obviously we uh this is a very good point in fact we uh we can do that and we do that Usually, when and when, they, when I say we, I refer to people working on, on not only in tax, also with an, applying analytics to tax uh, or other other areas. We usually take data from different sources. You just need to take care that uh, this data really are compatible and it's consistent, and you can uh, put it there without introducing any kind of bias on the. On the model, but that yeah, just uh, for sure that's a good idea, and that could give us. Uh, if we could put this here, this data, it could give us obviously a more complete view of the of the impact of these variables on the EBIT, including intangible assets, which are important, obviously. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you very much. So, 
Let I me think explain. That's let's, uh, yeah, let's have a question. Okay, the question is, according to this correlation matrix, which one of the following variables do you think it has the biggest impact on the EBIT? So you need to choose one of them. Total assets, revenue, number of full-time employees, or the inventory? See the results? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Because the revenue has got a, a correlation a percentage in this case of 93%. So uh, it's the highest correlation in this uh, particular uh, correlation matrix. So that's, that's perfectly responded. Okay, thank you very much. We can go for the following. <clears throat> Okay, so once we got this um, linear correlation matrix, we are in a position to know which is the economical and statistical relevance of each of the, um, of the uh, variables we have considered in our preliminary approach, which was this, which were these 15 variables we talked you about. But it is not enough because we, are, we are, uh, also need to do an economical relevance analysis of the variables to decide which of them will be finally going to our linear regression analysis. So that's the reason for this, for this uh, uh, table you've got here. The idea is to analyze uh, these 15 variables one by one, decide if they are uh, statistically relevant, statistically relevant, and economically relevant. To be included in the linear regression model, the variables need to meet both tests: the economic and statistical relevance that you can see in this in this column, and the economic relevance. So, only if the variable met both tests, the variable will be used in the uh, to produce the linear regression model. For instance, in the case of goods sold, we see that there is no reason to exclude from a statistical and economic point of view, and it also got uh, economic relevance according to the, our experience of the industry. So this uh, variable met both analysis, met both analysis, so will be included in the linear regression uh, model for this uh, PCA 3.0 analysis we're running. If we look at it in some way, this could be like, uh, you know, um, doing like a, a, a statistical test, so a technical test from a statistical perspective, but also a test from the industry, from the business, from the, um, yeah, from the business perspective. So you need to perform this kind of analysis, you need both knowledge. You need to understand the data from the statistical and econometric uh, perspective, but also you need to have this knowledge of the business, of the industry, to be able to pick up the variables that are really useful to, to run your regression model. So according to this table, the variables uh, which uh, meet both tests are the cost of goods sold, marketing expenses, number of uh, full-time employees, operational expenses, and I think that you need to go to the following slide, Amir, and the total assets. Okay, you can go to the following slides, slide again. Thank you very much. So what's the idea? Um, once we have decided that we've got six variables that um, met or meet, sorry, or met the statistical significance and the economical relevance uh, 
in a way that is enough to use them for the linear regression model, we implement this model. And a linear regression model is a mathematical model. Uh, what's the idea? The idea is modeling the relationship between uh, the independent variables and the dependent variable. If you remember, we talked before that the uh, dependent variable is the factor that you are trying to understand or predict. In our case, it is the habit. And the independent variables are the factors that we suspect have an impact on the dependent variable. By now, uh, we have uh, selected, if I'm not wrong, six variables, uh, as from the table in the slide bef uh, before. So that would be the variables uh, we, are, we will be using or we would be using to, um, as an input for the linear regression model. How does a linear regression model work? Or I, I would explain it um, in a very basic manner so people who has not this math background um, can understand more or less how it works, but that's not the purpose of the, of the session, but this is just to pick the intention of the model. If you look at this diagram on the right, you can see we, had, we got uh, some data points here in red, and we got the uh, x-axis and also the y-axis. As I explained before, we usually put the independent variable in the uh, x-axis and the dependent variable in the y-axis. So the idea is trying to predict the value for the y, which could be the EBIT in our case, starting from the value of the independent variable in the x-axis, which could be total assets, for instance. So uh, the model is just, you know, like a large mathematical formula that allows you to find the relationship between these data points and allow us to draw this line, which represents the relationship between the independent variable X and the dependent variable Y. What's the idea here? The idea here is that if at some moment I get a value for the X, I mean total assets uh, of five, so we are here in the X, in the, in the X axis, we can go up, you know, to the linear regression here and project this value on the Y axis. In this way, we could be able, we would be able to predict that for a value of five of total assets, we should have a value of almost 11 of EBIT. That's not very easy to explain. <laughs> that my purpose is just to, you know, transmit or communicate this idea of the purpose of this kind of models. Obviously, um, the model we used did not use only one variable, we used six variables, but we cannot represent the relationship between six variables, six independent variables and one dependent variable because we need to do it in a bit bidimensional way, so we cannot, uh, because this is a plot, so we cannot represent multiple dimensions. So we are uh, obliged to put us variable so we so one variable one independent variable or one dependent variable but in our model we use six dependent variables to barely paint with maths this line and projecting the value for these variables on the y axis predict the value of the edit okay that's the idea so this way the linear regression model in some manner map map the relationship between the independent variables and the dependent variable, the EBIT in our case. So when you have run this model, by interpreting the statistical results of the model, you can understand how the changes in the independent variables in the values of the X are related to the changes in the values on the value of the dependent variable. And you can imagine that the greater the change in the dependent variable, the greater the relevance 
or the significant of the independent variable as predictor. Okay, you can go to the following slide. Uh, so, having that in mind, if you remember, we have around two different regression analyses on the FASTA parallel industry, the first one on data from fiscal years 2013 to 2017, and the second one on data from uh, fiscal years 2015 to 2019. Uh, the significant predictor variables for the EBIT resulting from Model 1 and Model 2 are very similar but are not the same exactly. And then we will uh, try to understand why. For the first model, the uh, significant predictor variables were total assets, full-time employees, uh, operational expenses, cost of goods sold, and marketing expenses. And for the second model, which is the most, most recent, recent, was the, uh, uh, the significant uh, predictor variables were the total assets, full-time employees, Operating expenses, cost of goods sold, uh, by now we are at the same position, but then we cut the revenue instead of the marketing expenses. So, why we can get different results? Well, the, the models were very similar. The statistical assumptions were mostly the same. The data was also uh, similar in the sense that the companies were uh, almost the same too, but there was a big difference, uh, which is the, uh, the fiscal years uh, where, the, where the model were, with the model were for fifth. The data became for fiscal years that for the fast fashion uh, apparel industry are relevant. And I think that for all the industries are relevant. So when you've got a linear regression model, one of the insights that the model can give you is the following. You can know how much the value of the dependent variable changes when the dependent variable is increased by one unit. What I mean with that? I mean that what happens to the edit if the independent variables are increased just by one unit? That's the info you've got in these tables um, in, the, in the slide. The table in the left show this uh, impact for the model one and the table on the right show, shows this impact for the model uh, in the model two, according to the model two. So you have a look at these tables you can see, and you, got, you have a look at the full-time employees, the FTAs. The table on the left is saying to us that, according to the model one, if we increase the uh, full-time employees just by one employee more, the impact on the, on the edit, according to this model, would be more edit on the amount of 15,000 uh, 15, euros. Okay, you got this there. But if you go to the model two and you see the uh, the number of FTEs, if, what what is saying to you is that if you increase the number of FTEs just by one unit, if you put one more FTI, FTE, sorry, in the in the model, the edit according to the model, would increase in 628 euros. So that's a dif significant difference between the results um, of the two models. Uh, it's clear that the impact of uh, one employee, according to model one, is very, very, well, it's, high, it's higher, that's for sure much higher than the impact of increasing one employee in the Model 2, or according to the Model 2. Because of this difference, we have a question. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there is a significant difference between the impact of the number of uh, full-time employees on the EBIT between fiscal years uh, 2013 to 17, 2015 to 19? 
because of the introduction of the challenge strategy of the super fast fashion, a starting of logistics or all of the above. Almost all votes, yeah. Well, the winner is all of the above. We have some responses for the other options, but really all of them, we think that uh, all of them are, are valid. Uh, we can go for the next slide, Mir. Yeah. As we think that this uh, change in the models, with this reflecting is a change of dynamics in the fast apparel industry over these years, as what we can consider traditional value drivers are the number of employees or physical stores uh, were not so relevant as years ago. And as you have uh, responded to our question, uh, the omnichannel uh, approach, the customer journey, the rise of e-commerce, well, has produced really a change of uh, a very deep change of dynamics in the industry. And this change of dynamics is reflected in the data, not only by the uh, uh, num impact of the number of employees in the EBIT, but obviously in other, in other manners. But well, you can see it in the data. So doing this kind of analysis, it just so it's also useful to uh, be able to detect, to pick up, the change of dynamics of dynamics in the industry you are you are analyzing. Yeah, Julia, uh, I, I think this is quite interesting huh? because mm -hmm. we believe the OECD is right. Uh, they say more people means more profits, and obviously here could be, although the numbers are tentative uh, as we present them, um, I'm not fully cleaned up to the max. Um, you you see that the human factor in this. Uh, value chain of uh, of uh, fast fashion is is becoming less relevant in terms of the impact it has on the EBIT line. Therefore, uh, hence the OECD might be wrong in its assumption more people automatically means more profits. Uh, there's a question from the audience that I just yeah. uh, and, and 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 me talked about this a week ago. He says, hello, TPA team, this exercise is very extensive. Wanted to check if we can use predictive power score as well as to establish relationships where the relationship is not sy sy symmetric. Julia, you want to comment on that? Sorry, can you please repeat the question? Oh, um, but I just says, can we also use predictive power score? Um, to establish the relationship between the variables where the relationship is not that symmetric as in, in other cases. Oh, sorry, I don't pick the question, sorry. It, it, uh, open your, your Q&A at the bottom, then you can read okay. it. Okay. Sorry. Okay, where the relationship is not symmetric. Um, where the relationship is not, no, really, I understand the English, but I don't really, I'm not sure if I understand completely the question. But when you run this kind of linear regression analysis, uh, you can use not only this, um, you know, this impact on the increase of the number of uh, employees, for instance, to, to evaluate if the, um, if the variable uh, can predict the EBIT, because you've got other indicators. For instance, the linear regression can provide you with um, kind of, how can I say it? Kind of a uh, ranking of the variables, and you can order this ranking to understand which is the variable, for instance, with according to the model has a, a higher predicted um, 
potential or predicted value for the variable. So that's something we also use uh, when we try to understand and to uh, set these relationships between the independent variables and the dependent variable, we can do this ranking and use it, and we, we, we really do this ranking, and use it to establish this kind of relationship. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, sometimes it is more obvious and it is more, you know, related to the change of dynamics. In other, in other occasions, it's not easy to pick up the relation, um, but well, it, it, in all cases, it gives you an insight on the, um, on the relation between the value drivers, or which are considered the value drivers in the industry, and the actual evolution of the EBIT, and the actual impact of the EBIT, uh, on the EBIT of these value drivers. Okay, yeah, I think that covers it, uh, most of it, uh, Julia. But okay. What we need to say here is that the 15, um, the 15 uh, independent variables we listed, uh, are all variables which are uh, being influenced by the internal company. Uh, so they're all uh, very much under the influence of the management of the company, as you've seen. There's also a category of uh, independent variables which is not within the control of the management of the company. Uh, it could be uh, the dynamics in the market, uh, different geographies, uh, could be uh, market share, things like that are, are not yet captured in this model. Uh, so you have the internal independent variables and the external not controlled by the management of the, the multinational variables you could throw into the mix as well. But this gives you a first weighting of which is the most of the six value drivers we showed before, what, what is the most prominent value driver. Yes, in fact, um, obviously. And, and Julia, sorry, to one, sorry. one point that is based on, on extensive academic research on lots of data sets. Uh, there's been summaries on, on this type of uh, academic publish, publications, and they have identified roughly 15 independent variables which drive the profitability of industries across the world. And, and uh, around 15 external factors which do the same. So that's sort of the 30 variables mix you can pick from and, and have a pretty good neutral ground to say this is what other data sets have already proven to be uh, a, a good set of 30 variables, independent variables, which ultimately together drive the uh, EBIT line. Back to you, sorry. No, sorry, uh, and, uh, that, that's for sure. And also uh, the more data or the more variables, the more significant variables you are able to gather, the more complete will be your um, vision or your insights in the industry of the industry. So, uh, well, then, then you got the problem to extract the data, it's not always easy. The data is not always available, so it takes a lot of time and effort to collect data from uh, you know the industry to produce this kind of analysis. But in, in this case, we use the 15 variables, but if you are able to gather uh, other significant uh, variables to, to uh, incorporate it to the analysis, uh, obviously it will provide uh, 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 even more complete view on the on the impact of the value drivers on the EBIT in the industry, yeah. Okay. So, so that would be the third part of the analysis, which is to connect the result of the of the linear regression analysis to the value chain. So, as a result from the linear regression analysis, we've got um, six variables that may be or no, not maybe, that uh, result to have a significant impact on the EBIT according to the model. So these are predictor variables according to our model. And the uh, idea now is to link or to allocate these prediction variables to each part of the of the value chain in the fas uh, fashion apparel industry to uh, help to put some weight or some different weights in each part of the value chain uh, of the industry. 
Uh, for instance, uh, we can could allocate the OPEX to different uh, parts of the value chain. We could allocate to the design, to the manufacturing, logistics, marketing, and sales and distribution. The COX uh, could, variable could be allocated to the procurement. Total assets could be allocated to the manufacturing and the logistics. The uh, full-time employees could be allocated in general terms to all the value chain, but more specifically to the logistics and the sales and distribution part. And the revenue would be allocated to the sales and distribution part. So the idea is that using these um, variables, these predictor variables, to book these different weights uh, over the value chain in order to distribute or to be a, a, to a help and assistance uh, and add objectivity to the distribution of the residual profit within the value chain. Maybe still you can add more after the after the question that or, or before the question. I don't know if you maybe Steve. Could no, no. I think uh, let's do this poll number four. Also press for time a little bit, uh, Julia, okay. so that the audience. Uh, speak okay. This. Okay, so uh, how can BCA 3.0 be instrumental to BCA 1.0 and, and 2.0? So uh, do you think it adds objectivity to the other BCA uh, analysis? It put waste on each of the value drivers. It helps to understand the, the dynamics of the industry or all of the both. <coughs> Yeah, this was an easy one. Huh? I think most <laughs> of the people uh, understand uh, the messaging that, uh, yeah, the, you know, there's no right or wrong answer, but all of the above is, is closest to how we see it. Uh, ECA mm -hmm. 3.0 cannot be done in isolation. So you start with 1.0 qualitative uh, analysis of the six value drivers at the top of this visual. And you start with, uh, VCA 2.0, where in, in simple terms, the output of a VCA 2.0 hits your table one of your country by country report. That's the data of the multinational, its own value chain. And then this just fine tunes and adds uh, extra weight, uh, sorry, extra objectivity to the first two analyses, but also allows you better to, to give more weight to, for example, in a fast fashion, Design uh, is important, but not that important anymore. And sales and distribution and logistics and marketing is is, is much more prominent in uh, in the way uh, uh, companies um, conquer market share, so to say, in this fast fashion uh, industry. Uh, in in our internal uh, training, we have a, a picture where Shine. One of the Chinese fast fashion companies is invading this space as well, and you you see the dynamics of the industry as, uh, as the third point il illustrates. So I think BCA 3.0 just gives you that extra dimension, and and because it makes it more objective, you can also use it in your TP doc, and ultimately to support your uh, taxable income and your tax return. Okay, so just uh, some key takeaways. Firstly, that there is no 100% objective method to conduct the value chain analysis. Uh, BCA 2.0 and BCA 3.0 are quantitative value chain analysis. Just uh, 2.0 is based on the data from the MME, and the 3.0 is based on the data from the industry as we have just seen. And the purpose of BCA 3.0 is identify the variables that have a relevant impact on the EBIT to use them as allocation keys to the residual profit. And as Steve has uh, explained, uh, it adds subjectivity to the current way a BCA is performed based on the guidance of the OECD. And at the end, uh, BCA 2.0 and BCA 3.0 can be seen as corroborative sorry, method for transactional transfer pricing and you can use also to do as a complementary method for, for supporting your documentation and your transfer pricing policy. 
So as, as last question, would you use quantitative BCA 3.0 after this webinar? Yes for design of transfer pricing policy, yes for implementation, yes for both of them, or no, I don't expect to use it. Going to be an interesting uh, outcome. <laughs> Another an easy one to answer. So. <laughs> well, that's fine for both design and implementation. That sounds good. That's the winner. And there's some people that do not expect to use it. Well, really, this is something in advance, but really it's interesting. And I think that. Uh, we will move forward with that. So, so I think this is a good, a good exercise to do. Okay, so I think we are almost on time. Steve, I don't know if you want uh, to say Oh, something. great job. I think uh, people want to have further discussions with us. I know there's a few people we talk about this uh, on a regular basis online as well. Please uh, reach out to us. But we will be also looking into a, a next uh, area of VCA, and that is how we would apply VCA in the Latin territory. That's uh, either going to be a webinar just before summer, but most likely just after summer with our Latin team. Um, so uh, stay tuned on the, on the advice you get on, the, on these webinars. So thanks very much for your attendance. Yeah.